recording. Good day. We are Team PlayStation here to talk to you about the PlayStation 1 and all of the facts and history that surround that. And uh, this presentation will be presented by Benjamin Frank, Eric Galway, Sam Pollock, Robert Weimer, and myself, Ian Chapman. So let's talk about the console origins. Plans for the release model for the original PlayStation uh, began in 1988 when Ken Kutaragi, a manager for Sony's hardware engineering division, made a secret contract with Nintendo to work on a sound processor called the SPC-700 without the consent of Sony. Of course, this was eventually discovered by Norio Oga, Sony's president at the time. Uh, but instead of firing Ken, he was kept on board with the company due to the impressive results of the processor. It was this connection between Sony and Nintendo that would eventually lead to the co-venture between Sony and Nintendo to make the PlayStation, which was originally intended to be just an add-on for the Super Famicom, uh, otherwise known as the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. It was around this time that Sony began to take an interest in the video game market themselves. There had been an agreement with Nintendo and Sony to create the CD-ROM add-on for the SNES, but, Sno but Sony had decided to begin development on their own yet-to-be-named console, which was planned to also support SNES cartridges and CDs. With re but with research and development well underway, Sony actually got as far as announcing the initial release plans and designs for their new Super, Fam Super Famicom with the CD drive at CES in 1991, as well as a hybrid console, commonly known as the Nintendo PlayStation. However, on the day following this announcement, Nintendo stated that they were going to break their contract with Sony. Nintendo had realized that Sony may have gained too much of their own R&D from this co-venture, which could, and eventually did, result in a competing console entering the market. This was done to end Nintendo's cooperation with Sony and to slow further R&D with the development and release of Sony's future endeavors. However, Sony Computer Entertainment was founded in 1993, and the Sony PlayStation was announced on October 27, 1993. Uh, the PlayStation was released exclusively by Sony on December 3, 1994, just in time for the holiday season, with an improved SCPH-1000 sound processor, by the way. And now I'll pass it on to Eric to talk about finances. Great, thank you, Ian. So, a little bit about the financial history of the PlayStation 1. It was sold from 1994 to 2006, so a span of 12 years. And across that span, they sold a total of 102.5 million consoles. This was sold at 299 US dollars. Now, this is a 1994 uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index. Um, so, if in today's dollars, it would sit around 550 US dollars. So, right up there with the way consoles sell right, about, right now. It had 7,918 unique games, of which sold 962 million copies. Now, to give you a little bit of a baseline as to how they did compared to their competitors, uh, the N64 was the PlayStation's main competitor. It sold from 1996 uh, for six years, and it sold 33 million copies. So while the PlayStation 1 sold for a bit longer, it almost tripled uh, Nintendo's uh, console sales. So how were they able to achieve such financial success? Well, the first thing that Nintendo did was they used CD-ROM technology instead of the, the typical or famous Nintendo cartridge. Now, CD-ROMs could hold a lot more memory than cartridges. Specifically, they could hold about 700 megabytes versus 64 megabytes on a cartridge. Now, this may not have been important early on, but as the console got older, uh, games started to get more complicated, required more space, uh, the CD-ROM was still comfortable where the cartridge got and got pushed towards its limits. A bigger factor, actually, was also that the CD-ROM was a lot cheaper to produce and a lot faster to produce. For example, CD-ROMs cost about 40% of what cartridges cost to produce, and they, that could all be done in about a week. Whereas to produce a cartridge, uh, kind of the lead time was anywhere from two to three months, so a staggering amount of time. So because of all of these benefits, workers or game developers kind of flocked to the PlayStation and Sony, uh, whereas, and so releases were constantly streaming out, whereas with the N64, things kind of staggered off and releases weren't as fast, and there weren't as numerous. There was also some chip improvements with the PlayStation 1 that allowed them to be so powerful for so long. Uh, originally, there was uh, all the companies that Sony talked to quoted them that they would need two chips to kind of get the specs that they needed to, to build the PlayStation 1. 
That was until they spoke to a company called LSI. They were an American company, and they were able to complete all of Sony's needs in a single chip. And this was so important because they wanted it to be small so that a child could kind of handle and maneuver the console. To put it in perspective how powerful this chip was, it was able to complete approximately 500 million instructions per second. Compare that to the N64, it was only about 125 uh, MIPS, million instructions per second. So yeah, definitely a big history of success for the PlayStation. Um, it outsold the uh, N64, like I said, and those are a few reasons as to why it was so successful. Next, I'm going to be handing it off to Benjamin to talk about some of the uh, f sorry, frame uh, limitations. The PS1 and the games that ran on it had a distinct look to them. That look is often the result of some of the rendering limitations that the PS1 had. There are three main limitations, and I'll run through them. The first limitation is that the PS1 didn't have a Z buffer. That means that there's no way for the GPU to understand what polygons should be drawn in front of what other polygons. This sorting is instead handled by the programmers themselves, as they have to manually send polygons to the GPU in order from furthest to closest to the camera, in the right order, to correctly display a scene. While not technically software rendering, the lack of the Z buffer makes the rendering process very software oriented, and thus it can change from game to game. It's not super uncommon in some games to see models displaying in front of where they should be, and to have polygons of model get culled while still in view. The most recognizable effect of the lack of Z buffer, however, is the use of affine texture mapping. Because the polygon has no way of knowing the depth or angle at which it is being viewed, the scan lines that work to display the texture are inaccurate. That makes a trippy effect where the edges of the texture are correct, but the center of the texture is warped. This effect can be mitigated by subdividing the mesh but at the cost of performance, as you have more polygons to render. The second limitation is that all algebra had to be done with fixed-point numbers. All operations, most noticeably rotating, scaling, and translating models, are limited in their precision. Because the 3D world can only support precision up to a set threshold, vertices of models will appear to snap and twitch into a grid of allowable positions during any animation or motion. On the right of this slide, you can see a small diagram where the green outline indicates the position in which a polygon should be displayed. However, due to the lack of precision, each vertice of the polygon has to, quote, snap, unquote, to a set of predefined positions, the grid intersections themselves. While this method of rendering is efficient, it does cause the classic PS1 wibbly-wobbly models effect, where each model's vertices twitch and snap into positions. The third limitation is that the PS1 does not use MIP mapping. This is less of a limitation based on hardware or performance, but rather a consequence of choice. Now a quick refresher, MIP mapping of textures is the process of caching a texture at various resolutions in order to display a smaller, and therefore less resource-intensive, texture variant on surfaces that are far away from the player's camera. Along with the resource benefits, the reduction of resolution over distance also reduces the aliasing of textures, Mapping is not done on the PS1, and there are two advantages to not using it. One is that the space taken up by a smaller resolution variance of a texture can instead be used to handle a completely different texture, or maybe reallocated to something else altogether. This, in effect, can double the amount of memory budget for texture handling. Secondly, MIP mapping causes lower resolution textures to appear blurry. Scenes where low resolution textures are stretched to fill large parts of level geometry will have those textures often appear blurry. This is commonly seen on the N64. This blurriness does not happen with the PS1. The pixelation that there is on the textures is often unnoticeable when played on a CRT monitor. Hi, I'm Robert Weimer, and today I'll be talking about Sony Studios and major titles. Sony's first in-house studio was Polyphony Digital, responsible for the PlayStation's best-selling game, Gran Turismo, released December 23, 1997, and selling over 10 million copies. PlayStation had a total of 117 games that sold over a million copies each. Some of their most popular franchises include Final Fantasy, Tomb Raider, Crash Bandicoot, Gran Turismo, and Tekken, Final Fantasy being their best-selling franchise. These franchises sold over 114 million units. Sony also published over 40 games for various studios, including titles for Naughty Dog and Insomniac, both of which were later bought by Sony. Some other notable titles include Final Fantasy 7, 8, and 9, Diablo, Crash Bandicoot 1 and 2, Metal Gear Solid, Spyro the Dragon 1 and 2, Tekken 3, Silent Hill, Resident Evil 1 and 2, and Tomb Raider 1 and 2. Many of these titles are still seen today through their most recent installments. Sony also released the PlayStation 1, 
Released in July 2000, the PlayStation 1 was a smaller redesigned version of the original PlayStation. It was the highest selling console of 2000 and even outsold the PS2, which was also released in 2000. The new PS1 sold a total of 20 million units during its lifetime before it was discontinued in 2006. This was also Sony's first attempt at a redesigned and updated console. This PS1 featured a double speed CD ROM drive, 2 megabytes of RAM, and 1 megabyte of VRAM. The, ma the major design change was to place the power supply outside the console in an external AC adapter instead of the console itself. This caused the console to generate less heat inside the console and allowed them to downsize the overall design of it. Sony also released the PlayStation Classic, released December 3rd, 2018, on the 24th anniversary of the original PlayStation for $100. This console comes preloaded with 20 original PlayStation titles and ran off an open source emulator, PCSX Rearmed. Some of these titles included Final Fantasy VII, Grand Theft Auto, Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil, Tekken 3, and Rainbow Six. Although this release of the PlayStation Classic was met with criticism due to the console's game library, the use of PAL versions for certain titles, and the original controller, not the dual analog controller, which wasn't released until 1996. Thank you. Up next, we have Sam speaking on PlayStation emulation. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, and speaking of the PlayStation Classic, um, although it's still a, do a legally dubious undertaking, emulation is a huge field these days especially in the hearts and hardware of those interested in video game preservation. Folks trying to rescue titles marooned on old devices that are rare, expensive, and difficult to upkeep. In the 90s, however, emulation was the purview of extreme enthusiasts, detangling the secrets of cutting-edge hardware, as well as, more alarmingly for the companies producing consoles, a burgeoning business of back-alley deals and repackaged software. So on to the next slide. Let's start by considering the specs on the PS1, an RIS, RISC uh, MIPS of R3000 at 33.86 megahertz, at two megabytes of system RAM and one megabyte of video RAM. So in performance terms, the PS1 could render up to 4,000 sprites, 180,000 textured polygons, and displayed images at a 640 by 480 interlaced true color display. This was nothing to sneeze at in 1994, and by 1997, when PSMU, largest of the early PS1 emulators, entered development, achieving performance that matched the original hardware using consumer PCs was no easy feat. This challenge was exacerbated by the particulars of translating programs written to execute on the specific framework of the PlayStation to a new environment. On to the next slide. Let's introduce the distinction between interpreters and recompilers, two of the methods for emulating this content. An interpreter translates the code line by line. Uh, it runs basically the same way as an ordinary CPU. This method, though effective, is extremely non-performant. An alternative method, the dynamic recompiler, aka Dynarec or just-in-time compiler, looks ahead in the code and it reads chunks at a time and then saves uh, relevant and re frequently reused blocks of code in a data cache, it's like storing blocks of RAM uh, to dramatically smooth and accelerate the code. On to the next slide. With these challenges in mind, we'll take a quick tour of some of the first on the scene emulating the PlayStation in the 90s. There was the PSMU Pro in 97, which was a trailblazer in the scene. That created the plug-in standard still used by modern PlayStation emulators. There was, then there was Psych in 98 that used Direct, DirectX5 libraries and was written in C++ 4.0. And there was Soap in 1998 that was exclusive to Linux. And finally, FPSE in 99, uh, they used Dynarec and was technically advanced, but the development didn't make it that far. And on to the next slide. So following in the footsteps of these scrappy and fiddly freeware emulators, two companies arrived with emulators that were sold commercially, earning them the ire of Sony's legal teams. First, there was Bleem by the Bleem Company that was released at E3 in the year 2000. It also released on the Dreamcast as the Bleemcast. Uh, it was coded entirely in assembly and didn't use the BIOS whatsoever, and thus was blazingly fast. Speed let it outperform games running on the native PlayStation with anti-aliasing and texture filtering, filtering that weren't available on the original console. And it sold tens of thousands of copies at $30 a piece. 
in the next slide. Finally, there was the Connectix Virtual Game Station. Uh, it was originally on the Mac OS, made by Connectix, whose main software was the virtual PC for running Windows software on the Macintosh. So, so they rewrote the BIOS entirely in, in C language, and it ended up showcased by Steve Jobs at Macworld in 1999. They sold millions of dollars worth of copies at $50 a piece until they were eventually bought out by Sony. It was the legal proceedings surrounding these two projects, Bleem and Connectix, that became a proxy war for the field of emulation at large. The early wins and eventual losses of Bleem and Connectix forged precedent for the permissibility of emulation, which shapes the emulation field to this day. Okay, and that's what we've got. Thanks for watching our presentation. Uh, we're talking about the PlayStation 1. This was Benjamin Frank, Eric Galway, Sam Pollock, Robert Weimer, and Ian Chapman.